I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, event in our Tuesday with a Scholar Ali Talks series. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Public Library, and I am delighted to welcome today Nancy O'Brien Wagner. Um, we've been talking a lot about contemporary, you know, the historical background of contemporary events. It's kind of a relief, I think, today we're going to talk about something that really happened a hundred years ago. Um, the topic is um, Alice in France, um, Nancy O'Brien Wagner's great aunt, uh, and you'll hear much, much more about that, but you'll hear it from Nancy. Um, I would like to thank at this point uh, a couple of organizations that uh, make it possible for us to offer these history programs. First, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, our wonderful co-sponsor. If anybody's interested in learning more about OLLI, this fine organization, where is our OLLI representative? Yes, there is a hand going up. See that lady in the back there? Um, and also, our financial underwriter, Minnesota's uh, uh, Center, Minnesota, excuse me, Minnesota's Foundation for Arts and Cultural Heritage. So we are honored to have our speaker and we are delighted to have our sponsors. So let me turn the podium over now to Nancy O'Brien Wagner. Thank you. I'm going to turn down the lights. Thank you, Judy. Thank you all. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here today. Uh, libraries truly are the cradles of democracy. We've heard that all. And truthfully, I've been thinking a lot about democracy recently, as I suspect many of you have. It is election season, after all, and even we bookworms can't avoid it. I've been thinking about democracy. I've been thinking about our fatigue, our impatience, and our frustration with the whole thing. It is so tempting to fold up the paper, you can tell I'm an old school newspaper reader, turn off the TV, shut down the internet, and bury our head in the sand. Believe me, I feel that. You know what cheers me up? Thinking about World War I. <laughs> no, really, it does. I think about history and it makes me feel humble. It makes me care. It makes me screw my courage to the sticking point and raise my hand up again. We can't give up. We have to keep fighting. We did it 100 years ago. Alice O'Brien did it. We can do it now. So let's go and talk about World War I. Who here can tell me what caused World War I to begin? Come on, reach back, eighth grade, yes. You guys got it. That is exactly how we were taught. It was the death of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife. We're going to turn it up. Yeah, I, is that all right? I think I'm getting the sign from some of you that you'd like it a little louder. Of course. <coughs> Sorry, then. Go big, go big. Uh, no, no, it'll burn no, up. Sorry. God, okay. <laughs> so you got it right. Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife. But if you remember one interesting little piece of trivia from today, the first death of World War I was a woman. Her name was Sophie Schotek. The Duchess of Hohenberg actually died a few minutes before her husband. I think that's a really interesting fact that none of us were taught and none of us thought about and is in fact quite a good example about how women's role in history in World War I have been silenced. So, who killed Sophie and her husband? This is like the PhD level question. Yes. Great job, yes. The Black Hand was the name of this group and they were definitely what we would classify as a terrorist group. Um, the truth is, is that tensions had been very high in the region and had been for decades. In fact, the German uh, minister Otto von Bismarck had said back in 1888, one day, the great European war will come out of some damn foolish thing in the Balkans. And he was right. So, the assassination of Sophie and Franz set off this long chain of reaction. 
A complex set of alliances meant that a declaration of war between two nations would trigger a larger war between multiple nations. Germany was allied with Austria-Hungary, Russia was allies with Serbia and France, England was allies with Belgium. On July 28th, just one month after the assassination of Sovi and Franz, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia in retaliation. On August 2nd, Germany occupied Luxembourg, and on the 4th, Germany invaded Belgium. War had begun. That same day, here in the United States, President Wilson tweeted, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> he said, I love this sentence, and you book readers are going to love this sentence. Just listen to this language. I venture, my fellow countrymen, to speak a solemn word of warning to you against that deepest, most subtle, most essential breach of neutrality which may spring out of partisanship, out of passionately taking sides. The United States must be neutral in fact as well as in name during these days which are to try men's souls. We must be impartial in thought as well as action, must put a curb upon our sentiments, as well as upon every transaction that might be construed as a, as a preference of one party to the struggle before another. Well, as we know, brutal, brutal trench warfare ensued, and America stayed neutral. Generally, neutrality seemed like a good idea until May 1915, when Germany sank the Lusitania, which was technically a passenger ship, ship despite the hundreds of tons of munitions in the, in the hold. The deaths of over 120 Americans really angered the American public, and opinions began to swing against Germany. Germany did not want to goad us into war, so they agreed to no longer torpedo neutral or passenger ships. So America stayed neutral, at least on paper, and stayed out of the war for about 18 months, and that worked. It worked until about January 1917, when things began to swing and change dramatically. First, the American decoded the Zimmerman telegram, in which Germany attempted to recruit Mexico to secretly ally with them. If they did, Germany promised to help Mexico reclaim the territories lost in the Mexican-American War. At first, the existence of the telegram was kept secret. But then, in February, the Germany publicly announced her, their intentions to start re or restart torpedoing attacks on neutral and passenger ships. In February, the existence of the telegram was also publicized. In March, Germany started torpedoing ships and shot down five American ships. So, by April 1917, American public opinion had hardened against Germany and in favor of entering the war. When Wilson asked Congress to declare war, and they agreed to do so on April 6th, most, though not all, Americans were in agreement. In the Senate, six senators voted against the war. In the House of Representatives, 50 representatives voted against it, including four of Minnesota's 10 congressmen, probably something to do with the heritage of many Minnesotans at the time. Also voting no was the first woman representative to Congress, Ms. Jeanette Rankin of Montana. I want to stand with my country, she said, but I cannot vote for war. Nevertheless, war was declared, and most Minnesotans stepped forward to do what they could. For men, the main question was whether to serve in the military. In April 1917, the U.S. had an army of 165,000 and a National Guard of 181,000. That was a good start, certainly, but more was needed. Initially, Wilson hoped for an all-volunteer army, and in the three weeks following the declaration of war, around 97,000 men enlisted. Pretty impressive, but more were needed. On May 18th, about a month later, a draft was instituted, initially requiring men from the ages of 21 to 30 to register. Over the next 20 months, around 4.8 million men joined the military, and 2 million, about 40% of those men, enlisted voluntarily. I want to ask here who has a father who served in World War I? A couple of hands. Who here has a grandfather who served in World War I? This, however, was not just a man's war. On the day that war was declared, women swamped 
the Naval Recruiting Station in Minneapolis. The Minneapolis Tribune reported that women all over Minnesota and North Dakota are deluging the office of the Minneapolis Naval Recruiting Station with applications for enlistment as cooks, bookkeepers, telegraph and telephone operators, as stenographers and clerks. Send on the men instead, responded the chief yeoman. Nevertheless, they persisted. Approximately 25,000 American women served in Europe during the war, and 100% of them were voluntary. Around 5,600 of them were with the military as Army Corps nurses, Navy nurses, and Army Signal Corps telephone operators. I had a conversation just two days ago with somebody who told me women didn't serve in World War I. These women served as the military in World War I. Uh, besides these 5,600 military women were another 19,500 who served as overseas civilian volunteers, many of them as unpaid workers. The Red Cross, Salvation Army, YWCA, and YMCA were well known, of course, but there were other groups too, groups like the American Fund for French Wounded, the American Huguenot Committee, and the American Relief Clearinghouse. There were groups sponsored by Ivy League colleges and East Coast prep schools, such as Harvard, Yale, Princeton, St. Paul's, and Phillips Academy. In the end, there are about 100 of these smaller NGOs. At the time the United States entered the war in April 1917, the roles of each of these groups was still unclear. But by February 1918, the Red Cross's official jurisdiction over the sick and wounded was confirmed. They were in charge of the hospitals. Both the Red Cross and other relief agencies could continue to offer recreational, educational, and religious support to soldiers. Of the 25,000 women volunteers in France, about 15,000 of them worked for the Red Cross. They were the biggest game in town. Included, um, they established 551 stations from which they offered service. Included were 24 hospitals and 12 convalescent homes for soldiers. They operated 130 canteens. They established emergency depots of medical supplies for the American Army and for French hospitals. The Red Cross also produced and supplied all necessary splints, nitrous oxide anesthetic, believe me, you want that around, and oxygen for the Army. Beyond that, there was reconstruction and re-education efforts for crippled and disabled men, recreation and welfare service, hospital service, hospital farms and gardens, moving pictures for hospitals, gray photography, civilian relief, relief of French soldiers' families, children's relief, and anti-tuberculosis relief. Among those 15,000 uh, Red Cross women were about 450 Minnesota women. Most of those were nurses, but there were over 120 Minnesota women who signed up for a wide variety of non-nursing jobs. They were clerks, searchers, canteeners, social workers, drivers, nurses aides, recreational volunteers, stenographers, secretaries, and chemists. And among those 120 women was one in particular whom I fancy, Alice M. O'Brien. In 1917, Alice was about 26 years old. She was a remarkably adventurous woman, having grown up as the only daughter of William and Julia O'Brien. With her two brothers, Alice grew up in St. Paul among many wealthy and prominent families. Alice attended the Bacchus School. After that, she went to Bennett Finishing School in Vermont, a typical path for someone like her. Photos from this era show Alice as a, uh, an enthusiastic outdoors woman. A newspaper described her as a younger society girl who is known as an expert woman motorist. She is interested in all out-of-door sports and is equally skillful at golf, tennis, cross-country riding, and hunting. <laughs> Soon after her graduation from Bennett, the first hints of Alice's unconventional life began to appear. In 1911, the summer after her high school graduation, at just 19 years old, Alice and a group of friends, including Doris Kellogg, drove Alice's roadster to explore the American West. Imagine what that road trip must have been like. 1911. No cell phones, no Google Maps, no freeways. It was just a bunch of teenage girls, a dirt road, and a wrench. 
By this time, Alice had already developed her skills as a mechanic and driver. Family history recounts that her father taught her to drive by going up and down the driveway of her home, then up and down Summit Avenue. She taught herself about motors by taking apart her family's car and putting it back together again. Family lore also states that she was the first woman to have a driver's license in St. Paul and occasionally raced Louis Hill on Summit Avenue. In 1912, Alice traveled to Egypt and Europe with some friends. She particularly enjoyed her time in France. She was booked to return on the Titanic, but had to reschedule due to some mechanical difficulties with that vessel. Back in the States, she joined the suffrage movement, advocating for the vote. In 1914, she was photographed in her car promoting a lecture by Christabel Pankhurst, the famous and influential English, English suffragist. As head of the Political Education Committee of the Women's Welfare League, which also included her friend Marguerite Davis, Alice was responsible for engaging Miss Pankhurst and introducing her at the event. So, let's pause and imagine what life was like for someone like Alice 100 years ago. Can you imagine what a woman was like, what she was like? She was smart. She was independent. She was clearly adventurous. An exceptionally good shot, according to the paper. What paths were there for a woman like Alice 100 years ago? By 1918, she was 26 and single, an old maid by the standards of the time. Her friends were mostly married and already having kids, an average of 3.3 uh, by age 20, or marriage at age 22, 3.3 kids in Minnesota. What was there to do? What would you have done if you were in Alice's shoes? Well, there was this war going on. Alice faced a choice. She could join the local Red Cross in St. Paul, wrap bandages, march in parades, raise money, and coordinate scrap drives, or she could take a risk. In recruiting overseas volunteers, the Red Cross looked for a certain type of girl. The State Department decreed that women volunteers could not have a father, son, husband, or brother in the armed services, though the reverse was allowed for male volunteers. Volunteers had to be vouched for by leaders in their community and had to sign O's confirming their loyalty. Red Cross headquarters clarified that good temper, discretion, and self-reliance were essential, and that the women had to work for, be willing to work for a nominal salary. Stenographers and other office workers were restricted to ages 28 to 35, and similar age rules applied to other positions. Anyone younger than that apparently was too attractive for the male <laughs> members. Uh, preferably, volunteers should also have some knowledge of French or Italian. If you look at this list, this is perfect for Alice. She's got it all. So, in March 1918, Alice sailed away from New York on the SS Rochambeau with three friends, Doris Kellogg, Marguerite Davis, and Genevieve Washburn. They were bound for France and an adventure. Alice and her friends signed up to join the American Fund for French Wounded, an organization which she knew of through the Ames family of St. Paul. Once they reached Paris, they realized that their role as mechanics was severely hampered by the lack of cars available to the AFFW. After a few weeks of rolling around, they got a special request. Alice described it in a letter to her brother. The Red Cross asked us if we could assemble a Ford for them. We said, sure, send it along. And the next day they did send it in a box placed it carefully on the garage floor and left. We had a lot of fun putting it together and great was our interest when we got it all set up, cranked it, and it started. We jumped aboard it and ran it around the block, hanging onto the thing by our teeth because there was not a body on it. And the French people looked at us so much to say, three crazy Americans. The Red Cross man came over and inspected it and found everything okay and said that as long as we'd got that far with it, why not go a bit farther and make an automobile out of it? So we took the body off an antediluvian wreck that stood in the corner for months, put it on the new chassis, and then went for another ride. We finished this afternoon. There was nothing else to do, so we took the rest of the day off and went on a spree. Hmm. Sounds fun, doesn't it? 
Alice's letters, like most of the ones I have read from other Americans in France, were typically upbeat. It takes a careful reading to sift through her jolly language to uncover the facts. Listen to this next snippet with two halves of your brain. On one side, you'll enjoy her good storytelling. On the other, keep track of her descriptions of the war. The offensive is on again in Paris, and everyone is praying for the Allied armies. Poor brave fellows. I suppose hundreds of them are dying on the battlefield only 60 miles away. The Huns recommenced with all their fury and this time hoped to gain all that they expected to during their offensive of March. Everyone knows that they won't, but it's going to take time to down them. At half past six yesterday morning, we heard the big gun roar, so we knew the offensive was on again because the cannon has not been heard in Paris for 20 days. They continued to drop a shell every 20 minutes for about three hours and then let up until late in the afternoon when they commenced again. About 11 last night, the sirens shrieked their warning and everyone waited for the Goths to arrive, but they were turned back north to the city, so soon after, the all-clear was given and everyone went peacefully to sleep. This morning, Bertha started again at daylight and has popped three or four times during the forenoon. The Germans are obviously, oh, the cannon just boomed again, away off in the distance, sounding like a sunset gun at Fort Snelling trying to break down the morale of France by scaring the civil population so badly that industry will suffer from it. But they have a long way to go. No one pays any attention to their silly old cannon, and every air raid makes people resolve to see this war won if it takes years to do it. The Germans are just like animals, haven't the spirit or courage of humanity. I wish the Allied Air Force would blow every town in Germany to pieces. I wish I had a little airplane of my own to use on these bright, sunshiny afternoons. Dodie Muggs and I were walking along the Place de la Concorde yesterday morning on our way to the Red Cross, talking excitedly about the offensive, when the big gun landed a shell just a few blocks away with a bang that must have been heard in New York. Muggs gave one whoop and went about three feet into the air. An old Frenchman was passing, many in fact, but this one in particular threw back his head and roared. I, don't, I think it was the first good laugh he's had since the war began, and he went down the street, deviled over in mirth. So, if you're keeping track, the letter referenced hundreds of men dying in a battlefield just 60 miles away, over 24 hours of bombing, and over 40 individual bomb blasts, an air raid, and a bomb that fell just a few blocks away from her. But the whole thing sounds like a blast, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there were no more cars to fix at the AFFW, so Alice and two of her friends received permission to shift to the Red Cross. They signed up to be cantiners, but served as clerks in the casualty department while they waited for their assignment. In the meantime, the spring offensive began. She was immediately assigned to work in a hospital. She wrote, The wounded started to pour into Paris, and in 24 hours the hospitals were crowded to the doors, beds in all corridors, operations going on all day and night, men's wounds being dressed in wards, hallways, or wherever they could get room to lay them. We were sent to hospital number one, used to be the American ambulance at Nully, just outside of Paris and only 15 minutes from Place de la Concorde, and told to do whatever we could to help. Hospital number one is a huge place with 1,200 beds, and when I saw it filled to the overflow with American and French wounded, I wondered that there were any men left at the front to check the Germans. The first morning we reported, we were put into a bed-making squad, and I swear, I think we made every one of the 1,200 beds. So many of them have been gassed, and I almost feel sorrier for them than I do for the ones that are suffering from gunshot wounds, shrapnel or otherwise. The gas very often burns their bodies horribly, but always affects their eyes, throats, and lungs. It is unspeakably sad to see the poor fellows doubled over in agony of coughing and realizing what they must be suffering. Soon after, Alice got promoted from bed maker to auxiliary nurse. She wrote, Today was our frith as auxiliary nurses, and I cannot believe what we have done, all that we really have. If you would like to know a few of the things I did today, read the following. Washed faces and hands, made beds for the ones not seriously ill, give Dakin treatment to, um, to men whose wounds were being treated with it, removed dressings from all wounds so that they would be ready for the doctor. Some of the wounds are dreadful and some not so bad. The Russian has had his leg amputated just below the knee. One man has a dreadful head wound. One has shrapnel wound the size of a saucer in the middle of his back. 
One has the calf of his leg shot away. One, a poor young French boy, has a bayonet wound through his abdomen, and I'm afraid that he's mortally ill. And one has a gunshot wound that enters through one side of his body and comes out the other. Most of these men get the Dakin treatment, a system of drains and wet bandages, assisted the nurse and doctors at the dressings, bound up all wounds after dressing, made the Russian's bed a slow and painful operation, took all pulses and temperatures, gave them their luncheon, did Lord knows what all the afternoon, gave them dinner at six and came home to my own, tired as a dog, but thoroughly satisfied and happy with the day's work. I would have had to have had training in America before I would be allowed to do half of what I did today, but over here they tell you to do the best you can and you go ahead knowing that if you don't do it, nobody else would, and I suppose something is better than nothing. I had to hold a, bed, I hold a man down in bed yesterday, leaning my full weight on his chest and holding his hands down while his wounds were being dressed. It took about 10 minutes, and during the entire dressing, he shrieked with pain, prayed out loud for relief, and called for his mother. In mid-June, Alice and her friends were transferred to a French canteen in Ori la Vie. There, her initial job was to work as a canteener, helping to prepare food and serve it to the soldiers on the front headed to the front. The personnel consists of Miss Church, the directress, 15 American girls, all volunteers like ourselves, one chauffeur, and about 15 servants, cooks, dishwashers, vegetable pairs, scrub women, etc. The canteen is open day and night, but the big rush comes for dinner at noon and for supper at 5.30. We feed about a thousand men each noon and about the same each evening. In addition to the main canteen where regular full-sized meals are served, we operate a place called Le Goot, which means the drop, and is a little booth uh, where the poilu can come get hot coffee or chocolate, sandwiches and hard-boiled eggs at any time of day. For instance, the poilu pay two cents for coffee, four cents for chocolate, and 15 cents for a full meal consisting of good meat, potatoes, a vegetable, salad, which, by the way, they cannot live without, a bowl of soup, a hunk of bread, dessert, which is usually fruit or nuts and raisins or stewed fruit, and a cigarette. The other days I watched them, I could hardly keep the tears back. They are so sad and have been fighting for four years, are pitifully poor, and most of them leave huge families behind when they go off to the trenches. Many of them get their last good meal before they enter the trenches, and unhappily, many of them have their last real meal on earth in our canteen. We have a phonograph which plays while they eat, and most of them are the happiest crowd in the world. They laugh and sing and always have a pleasant word for everyone, and 20 minutes after they shoulder their packs, gas masks, shovels, rifles, blanket rolls, canteen, mount the train, and are off to the trenches. As you would predict, Alice did not report everything she saw and occasionally sugarcoated the difficulties that she faced. She often downplayed the danger, too. Hear what she wrote one night as the shells exploded in the garden beside her rooming house. We have had several Bosch planes come over us lately, and in broad daylight, they are trying to sneak back over the lines and find out where Foch has its reserves massed. It is very exciting to see one in the air and the anti-aircraft shells popping all around him. They look like pieces of white popcorn against the blue sky. All during the last two wonderful attacks and victories of the Allies, we've heard the roar of the guns day and night, more insistent and oftener than usual. It is an ominous sound to go to sleep to, but you get just as used to it as to everything else in life. Your last letter spoke of us being near the front. Don't worry. No Red Cross girls are ever within shell fire. We are safe wherever we are because people are always looking out for us. And besides, the Germans are going the other direction these days. Alice was likely sparing her family the details, both to prevent worry, but also perhaps to cut off any criticism. She had enlisted despite the disapproval of her father, who continued to discourage her efforts even while she was in France. Max wrote to say that he called and found you all at home, and that Dad was still saying that I had no business in France. I wish he could see me for about 12 hours out of the 24, and he might change his mind. As you can see, Alice was a keen and observant writer, noting the details of what she experienced and blending in her knowledge of the world. Her letters revealed that she was aware of the momentous times in which she was living. She knew her circumstances were unusual, 
but I'm not sure she realized that she was unusual. This letter to her brother Jack, who was initially rejected to the army because of his poor eyesight, captures some of this. Mama wrote that you were thinking of coming over with the Red Cross, so I thought I'd write you and say how I think things stand over here. All the soldiers seem to have a great respect for the Red Cross, but seem to resent seeing so many young men among the personnel. I think myself that a good bunch of them are slackers, but also know that a lot of them, like yourself, can show their draft board refusals, but they are not always given the benefit of the doubt, which is not at all fair, but c'est la guerre. I have talked to many wounded soldiers in the hospitals and around about, and they speak the Red Cross men, the healthy ones, as bummies. If you could come over and be sure of getting a real job in a frontline canteen or driving a Red Cross ambulance, it would be worth the racket. But otherwise, I would, stay, I would rather you stay in the U.S. and fill a man-sized job as you are doing. The chances are that if you came over, you would have to either be kept in Paris, attached to an American base hospital in southern France, or drive a truck for a canteen. But I cannot imagine you being satisfied with the job such as our chauffeurs have. Our chauffeur is good because, at present, I am one of them. The driver of the Ford at canteen number two went on a spree and was peremptorily dismissed, so I'm filling his shoes. Do not yet know whether they're going to send us another man or send me a license, and I don't much care what they do. Here we see some of her contradictions. She's aware that the male volunteers are unfairly perceived as bummies, yet she herself thinks many of them are slackers. She values the work at the front as the real jobs and dismisses those behind lines, which would include herself. Her claim that she didn't care about getting formal permission to become a driver was pure malarkey, though. A later letter described her joy at being formally instated as a driver, a position that no woman was supposed to have. I love these letters because they capture these contradictions, the way these strong, deep, and completely inconsistent ideas snuggle side by side in our minds. There was no conflict for Alice of the time, at least none that we see in her letters. She was a woman of a certain type, confident of her value to the world. The last point, her confidence in her value to the world, that is something to pause and consider more deeply. Remember that this is 1918. Alice was blessed with education, wealth, and an extra large measure of chutzpah. But that does not outweigh a central reality of her life. She was a woman living at a time when women had very few legal rights. She did not even have the right to vote. Take that in for a moment and appreciate it. Alice went to war to fight for our nation, a nation that was deeply flawed, a nation that did not treat her as an equal in any significant way, legally or socially. She stood up and fought despite her fatigue, despite her frustrations. She fought for a future for America. Like many other women volunteers, Alice returned from France proud of her accomplishments and inspired by the example of organized action that she had witnessed. Back in St. Paul, Alice continued with her activism, travel, art collecting, philanthropy, and women's causes. In June of 1919, as the men and women who served in France continued to trickle home, the U.S. Congress finally proposed the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote. I suspect the evidence of the intelligence and strength of women like Alice had helped to sway some minds. In August 1920, the amendment finally passed, but Alice did not retire from her political activism. In October 1920, she became Minnesota chairman of the Organization of Republican Women's National Motor Corps, a group that I always have to say twice because I love it. She was the Minnesota chairman of the Organization of Republican Women's National Motor Corps. This was a group that offered to drive their cars to help mobilize speakers and, sub and support electioneering work. She joined the Women's Overseas Service League and was active in the League of Women Voters. During the 1920s, Alice continued to be a wide traveler. In December 1921, she and her friend Catherine Ordway set sail on a trip to China, Japan, and the Philippines. In 1927, she traveled with Grace and Blair Flandreau to Africa, trekking up the Congo and across land to the eastern coast of Africa. Footage of that was turned into a film that was shown nationwide. In 1929, Alice took charge of building a permanent home for the Women's City Club in St. Paul. She led the efforts to choose a site, select an architect, draw up the plans, and raise money for the clubhouse. She completed all her tasks in the first two years of the Great Depression, 
and oversaw the opening of the new clubhouse in 1931, debt-free. <coughs> Among the many roles that she embraced was that of a promoter. In 1931, she helped toss tickets from an open airplane to promote an opera. Throughout the 1930s, Alice continued to travel. A frequent visitor to Florida to help manage her family's lumber interests, it was during this time that Alice began to visit Captiva. She was an early booster and investor in Captiva Island, where she developed a close relationship with Ding and Penny Darling. Alice was also a conservationist, and her love for the outdoors led her to donate 180 acres of land to the state in honor of her father, William O'Brien. In 1963, she died, and the park named in honor of her father has remained her most visible legacy. One hundred years ago, this week, October 1918, Alice wrote back to her youngest brother, Robert, at boarding school, urging him to focus on his studies. In the past, I've often read these words as charming, very sisterly nagging. Today, I hear something more meaningful. She wrote, there are a lot of men dying in the fields of France for the future of America, and the boys in schools today will be the citizens of tomorrow. So make hay while the sun shines, and remember that in learning to be a credit to a school, you are learning to be a credit to the nation. Today, I encourage you to take her words and actions to her heart. Make hay while the sun shines. Be a credit to your school, your family, your community, and your nation, and fight for the future of America. Thank you. I'm happy to take some questions. Yes? Uh, the question was, did she marry? And the answer is no, she did not marry. Um, on her trip to Africa, the newspapers uh, described one of her companions, Ben Burnbridge, the great hunter, um, as her fiance. Uh, but that was just one newspaper, and they may have been trying to be romantic and dramatic. We do have a letter uh, from the end of the trip where she wrote, I cannot wait to see the back of Ben Burnbridge. <laughs> um, she had very strong female relationships. Um, we don't know. Yeah. Yes. Has she been written about in books? Been written about in books? Um, no. She is, she is included in 10 Women of Minnesota, the 1978 bestseller, which I'm sure you've read. Um, she's right in there with Jane Grey, Swiss Holm, and Harriet uh, Bishop, and some other truly remarkable women. Um, but no, she, beyond, beyond these letters, there's no book about her. Yes, sir? Yes, he asked of uh, the women volunteers, were they affected by the Spanish flu? And they were. Um, in fact, Alice herself was in the hospital in fall of 1918. Luckily, it was just like a tonsillitis issue. We're lucky she didn't catch something. Um, one of the five Minnesota women who died, um, died that month from the Spanish flu. So it was definitely around her at that time. Yes. Um, She asked, did these women get paid anything? And um, some of the Red Cross volunteers took a very small stipend. In fact, Alice wrote that one of her friends had signed up for six months to work for free, but that at the end of the six months she had to go home because she couldn't, she couldn't afford to stay there much longer. Um, I always think it's amazing to think about these women who could afford to go, were not married, didn't have children, had enough wealth, could speak French. I mean, that's a pretty self-selecting group. Um, so some of them took pay, and many, many of them did not. And that's how we were able to have so many over there. Yes, there was a question in the back. Mm-hmm. The question is, how did I find the letters, and who saved them? Um, so Alice had two brothers. Uh, one of them died young. The other was my grandfather. And um, the letters had been kept by the family. We have letters to her parents, to the brothers, to Aunt Lorena, to all these different people. And they sort of kind of kept them and passed them around. 
And um, my father passed away about 10 years ago. I was cleaning out the attic with mom. This is a story you've all gone through or are about to go through. And I found the typed manuscript. Um, it had, was like blown across the floor as if the window had been opened. And I asked my mom, what's this? She said, oh, your father was trying to type up Alice's letters. I was like, oh. The historian to me was like, ooh, that looks good. And then six months later, we were cleaning out the other room, which is something you've all been through or, or about to go through. And we found the original letters. Um, so they had been passed through the brother to the son. And um, so I went through and uh, finished the transcription that my father had begun and, and added all the additional material to it. So um, it, was a, it was a literate society. People wrote a lot of letters. There are amazing stories in the attic. <laughs> amazing stories. Yes, in the back there, and then. I'm wondering if you were intending to turn this So the question is, how did it become a book? Yes, I, um, I am a historian, and so I'm always looking for a good story, but also I'm aware of personal bias. <laughs> So my first reaction is, ooh, good story. And my next reaction is, no, it's just your just family vanity story. I'm like, no, I think it's good. So uh, thanks to the Minnesota Taxpayers Land and Legacy Act, I actually approached the Red Cross and said, I would like to write a story about these Red Cross volunteers who are not nurses. We all know the nurses, virtuous, virginal nurses. Let's go find the mechanics. And they said, yeah, we want that story. So they agreed to write a grant to have me do the research on it. And so I actually researched Alice and all these other women and wrote an article that was in Minnesota History Magazine. We're doing, we're doing a um, already. Oh and they accepted the article. And Thanks. six months later said, you know, I've got a book too. And uh, they said, oh, thanks, but no thanks. I was like, well, oh, it's all right. Again, you know, I'm a little biased and it is letters and, you know, I, I get that. But here's, here's my, my braggy story. So about six months later, the article won um, the Solon J. Buck Award for Best Article in Minnesota History Magazine. And so I went to the award ceremony, and I ran into my editor who said, hey, have you sold that manuscript yet? And I had that moment of going, uh-huh, yeah, Scribner's is going to give me a two million. <laughs> and I said, no, I haven't. I haven't even shopped it around. She said, I'd like to see it again. So the Historical Society um, took the manuscript and accepted it, and, and it came out a year ago. Yeah. <laughs> I know! Yay! Yay. Uh, there's a question up here. Let me uh, give you the microphone. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. I enjoyed it. Uh, when I saw your title uh, of the talk, I thought of Alice B. Toklas. Ah, yes. And mm -hmm. I thought I remembered reading in her autobiography that she and Gertrude had been ambulance drivers, is that correct? Yes, so this is the thing. Everyone um, often thinks of, of Alice Toklas and Gertrude Stein because of their work as ambulance drivers. That, from what I know, is they just like grabbed a car and started driving around Paris and picking up people. It was not a formalized thing. Um, truthfully, because men were doing it and they were funded and they had, um, they had the cars to do it, so uh, there were no women Red Cross ambulance drivers. There are only male Red Cross ambulance drivers. And in fact, as you saw, Alice wasn't even supposed to be a canteen supply truck driver because they really thought that women couldn't drive. Um, but she, because she had put together the car for the Red Cross headquarters, when they, when they telegraphed the head Red Cross headquarters and said, the male drivers are drunkard, Alice O'Brien is, is driving, they were, oh, she's the one who can put the, yeah, she can drive, yeah. Who has another question? Um, okay, uh, I'll, and then I'll get back there. I don't know if it's a comment or a question, but I think what you're surprising me with is the privilege of the women, because mm -hmm. I am more familiar with the nurses' stories and people who would have done jobs here or somewhere and then decided to go overseas. Mm -hmm. What was it about, and the famous names you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, what was it about, you know, what you're blowing is my stereotypes of the debutantes. And um, what was it about the spirit? Is it that New England spirit that came with the leaders or the people? And some, 
What? I mean, I'm just surprised. It is amazing. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the list, it's the Rothschilds and it's the, I mean, it's the banker's daughters who are going over there. And I think, you know, I don't remember Ivanka Trump volunteering in Afghanistan 10 years ago. Um, but I also, I mean, that has been a change that has happened in 100 years. Um, and these were smart, well-educated women. Um, they really did have a good reason to not do it. And they went at enormous danger. Um, so... I think it's an inspiration to all of us. One thing I also take away from it is over 100 years, we've really had this professionalization of the role that women used to play in our society. Women were running the libraries and the museums, and the art museums and the children's hospitals and the libraries and you know all those things those smart women matrons used to do have become professionalized and think I'm glad librarians are paid. I'm in favor of nurses being teachers getting paid. Um, Yes, uh, but what's interesting is because we professionalize that, we all have this feeling of like, I can't, I'm not a professional, I can't do that. But Alice and the whole spirit of the culture was, I don't know how to nurse, I, I can, maybe I can fix a car, I don't know how to be a cantiner, I, but they did it anyway. They said, we're gonna go, let's get our hands dirty, we'll make mistakes, that's okay. And everyone turned to them and said, yeah, I'm gonna try too. So I think we can really learn something about that spirit of just trying, just going for it, you know, and don't, don't hold yourself back and say, I need to have the professional degree to try something. And when you see somebody trying, somebody who's not an expert, say, yeah, get in there. We'll figure it out. So, yeah. They went with their club of friends. She went with her club of friends. Yes, one was from the finishing school, one was from St. Paul. Genevieve Washburn was actually from Duluth, not related to the, the flour mill Washburns, uh -huh. but um, they, were, they were an amazing group of women. Yeah. Got a question over here. Yes, Nancy, you uh, did mention William O'Brien. Mm -hmm. So that it, was that your grandfather or your great-grandfather? That would be my great-grandfather. Yeah. And, and the state park was named after him, a donation of land or property or something. Yes, yes. When was that uh, established, do you know? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's a, a cute story. Um, he grew up in Taylor's Falls with his father, John O'Brien. They lumbered up the St. Croix River until the logs were gone. Then they went over to the Kettle River and the Snake River and Mille Lac. They just kept going. Um, that's a legacy of mine, too. You're welcome for my family destroying the timber. Um, <laughs> But he, in 1920, was walking where William O'Brien State Park is today with his daughter and his dog, Pat. And they were walking along, and he stopped and started telling stories of being a young lumberman and walking through the forests. And his daughter said, Dad, let's buy the land. And they did. <laughs> so they bought the land, and they had picnics and enjoyed it until 1925 when he died. And then his wife, Julia, died in 43. And Alice gave the land in 45. It was originally 180 acres. It's like tripled in size because of other families donating land and the state um, investing in that park. But it's, it's a, I mean, it's a park about a lumberman, which is great. But Alice was kind of cool too. And there's, there's a Lake Alice there, and that's her, so. Yeah. Uh, let's see, additionally, there is a lady. Yeah. Yes. But, but wait, wait for the mic, okay? <laughs> because it's being filmed, so everybody can hear the question. I'm wondering how the O'Briens made their money. Where'd their fortune come from? Um, well, William and his father, John, were kind of mid-level uh, lumbermen. And um, he made a wise investment in 1894 after the first Hinkley fire and the financial panic. Um, credit was gone, and the timber looked bad, and everyone sort of backed out of the timber industry, and William reinvested and bought up a, a large tract of land in Hinkley and sold it a year and a half later. And that sort of launched uh, a much larger national lumber career for him. So he um, expanded up into northern Minnesota, was part of the Virginia Rainy Link Railroad. He had places in the Bahamas, Carolinas, and Florida. Um, and uh, one little braggy story is that he was apparently a very good cruiser and he would walk the land and kind of eye the trees and say, oh, this is worth that many you know, pine board feet and that and this and that. And he would often be up against a warehouser in, in auctions and bidding for the land. 
and William would sneakily start bidding on things, and everyone knew he was good. And so if William O'Brien was interested in something, Weyerhaeuser would start bidding on it. And Weyerhaeuser could always, always, always outbid him. So Weyerhaeuser would get the land, and then William would go and buy the next tract, which is what he really wanted, so. <laughs> We have a question back here. Yes. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, um, the American women went over there for the war effort. How, how much of a war effort was there from the French women? And you mentioned that the American women were supposed to be able to speak French. Did they kind of in, in, intermingle and help each other out? Or how did that all work? That's a very good question. Um, the, the French women were... Um, were doing what they could. They, they were in the munition factories in France, so they were kind of um, working factories as well as they could. Um, Alice writes in one of her letters, she said, these French women are not liberated like we are. And it's a snobby thing to say. I'm not sure if it's accurate, um, but it was her perception that the American women were stronger. Uh, she sort of hoped to inspire the French women, but, uh, you know, 100 years ago, you're on the farm with your five kids and your husband's off, I, I don't really know. I, I don't blame those French women for not grabbing cars and driving. Yeah. Who else has a question? Okay, back here. You guys have great questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I have an uncle that was a surveyor, and she's died in 60s. Yes. Anyway, mm -hmm. the, the story that I got, he surveyed the land of Alice O'Brien's, I thought, and it's like Croyside, I think, just south of Marine, mm -hmm. and he got a really nice parcel out of that as his payment, but I just, yeah. would that be an uncle or Alice, or how would that be? So Alice would be my great aunt, yeah, yeah and she had some property there in Marine and St. Croix. Besides the, yes, besides the park, yes. yeah. Yeah, she had a few different parcels in that area. And that was her summer home, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, ma'am, I'll bring it up. Who else has a question so I have them lined up for... Who else? May, may we presume that your undergrads are getting this information? My so undergraduates! Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. I have had two compliments. First of all, Judy brought me, um, or she offered me dark coffee, which I like because <laughs> like, I'm bohemian, right? If I like dark coffee, I'm like, no, I need the light stuff with the cream and the sugar. Um, and I also appreciate your compliment. I do not have students. I am an independent historian. I'm not affiliated with a university or college. I uh, help consult with museums and historical organizations that need help. So I actually create exhibits and produce publications and signage and things like that. But I don't teach. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm wondering when she died, mm -hmm. and assuming that you have not met her, mm -mm. so if your parents had any specific stories about her. Yes, I, that's a good question. I, she died about 10 years before I was born, and the stories of her were sort of these like Auntie Mame kind of stories. <laughs> she used to smoke, and she fed her horse Trigger her cigarette butts. <laughs> And she was always late to church, and she'd put the nieces and nephews in the back of her car and drive to Stillwater on the road with the kids, you know, flying from one side to the other in the car. So there were these stories of her that were sort of outlandish and bigger than life. And ironically, I'd heard she was driven an ambulance. So when I found these letters, I was like, well, you know, who was she? And it was so interesting to go back and hear the voice of this 26-year-old because that's, you're going to be remembered as old by your descendants. They're not going to remember you as young. Um, so it's really fun to get that connection and to see what she was like. Um, she, was, she was a lot of fun, apparently, kind of a big character. Um, one fun story is that she had an old Packard that she wanted to give to one of her nieces and nephews. She had four nieces, well, one niece and three nephews. My father was, a, was one of the nephews. And to decide who got the car, she um, played a, a one-card stud game. Whoever pulled the card, that <laughs> was the highest. And so my parents won the Packard with the Jack of Spades. You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Those were the stories about her. Yeah. Who else has a question? Another question? Yes. What did she do after she returned from the war? So as I mentioned, she, um, she was involved in the Women's Overseas Service League. 
Uh, she became deeply involved in the Women's City Club in St. Paul. Um, she, in the 1930s, went down to Florida and started to invest in Captiva Island. Um, she became a big yachter. She had a series of Wanigan boats, and there's some people in their 60s and 70s who remember her and her big Wanigan 3 up in Stillwater, her big boat. Later on, she described yachting as an advanced form of senility. So she moved on from that. Um, she was just a, an active aunt. Um, she had no professional career beyond managing her parents, her family's lumber interests, which dwindled away in the 30s. Other question? If not, I have a question. Yes. Um, she has an Irish last name, and they're roughly contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Did she know F. Scott Fitzgerald? You know, that is a, I love that question, too. <laughs> um, so she was about seven years older than uh -huh. F. Scott Fitzgerald. They were definitely in the same social circles. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that also that's a great example of she could have been Daisy, you know? <laughs> she could have been Daisy. She could have been smoking and drinking and playing mm -hmm. golf and marrying and buying fashion, and she went to war. <laughs> so um, I don't have any accounts of her at the party, but they did know people in common. I oh, do know yeah. that. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone? Um, okay, did I, did I? Anybody who hasn't asked a question before? Okay, all right, here we go. I'm happy to answer uh, private questions too at the end. I've got nine copies of the book if anyone wants them for $20. Funny you mentioned it. I was going to ask you a personal question. Oh, um, <laughs> um, You mentioned you're kind of an independent <laughs> historian slash publisher. Uh, writer, yeah. Yeah, and in this, in this day of age of dying um, words and newspapers and everything else, um, is it a struggle to make a living doing that? Oh, boy. Um, the Land and Legacy Tax Act of 2009 that we all paid for, the thing that pays for the, the ducks and the Ordway and the historians, has been this really amazing amendment. It's the 0.5 sales tax um, and that money has been funneled to historical organizations across the state. It has about a 10 years left on it. It was a 20-year amendment. Um, it has really helped local historical societies. So I just want to give a pitch to all of you who voted for that or all of you who are paying for it. Um, it's really been amazing. So uh, yes, it's possible. No, it's not a lot of money. Um, but it's enough. So yeah. And I'll point out that another beneficiary of that amendment is this series. Mm -hmm. This series is made possible because of the passage of that amendment. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> is there anyone else with a question? Okay. All if right. Not, thank you all very much. Thank you.